Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute at the University of Melbourne. I'm Georgina Downer and I'm the host of Afternoon Light. Each week I speak to leading thinkers from around the world about Robert Menzies, his life, his era and his enduring legacy. Hello and on today's episode of Afternoon Light I am talking to Clem McIntyre who is an emeritus professor at the University of Adelaide and an expert on British, Australian politics and political history. And we are sitting here at his beautiful house in the Adelaide Hills near Mount Lofty, overlooking the Adelaide skyline. You can see it through the beautiful trees. And it's wonderful to be here talking about, I guess, the history of conservative politics in South Australia and how it all one day became the Liberal Party here. That's right. And it's good to be up in the Adelaide Hills. We're going to be talking a bit about Tom Playford and, of course, as well as being longest serving South Australian Premier, famous for being a cherry grower in Norton Summit, not too far from here. Oh, yes, another politician <laughs> <laughs> who's a, got a more modern contemporary history was part of a family of cherry growers as well, mm, isn't she? That's uh, right. <laughs> so, Clem, I just thought we could start off our conversation by talking about Thomas Playford and who he was and where he came from, aside from growing cherries in the Adelaide Hills and Norton Summit? Well, he was principally a farmer in the Adelaide Hills, as his father had been before him. But he came from, obviously, a political family. The Playfords arrived, I think, about three generations before Tom Playford. The Tom Playford we're talking about was born, and he was the fourth, I think, of a line of Tom Playfords. Every one of the oldest boys was called Tom. So Thomas Playford, who was Premier in the late 30s and through the 40s and 50s, was the grandson of a former Premier in the late 1800s in South Australia. Really before the formation of major parties, the older Playford, Honest Tom as they called him. Was that in contradistinction to Dishonest Tom? Or? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> Worries me here. <laughs> no, it was Honest Tom was, I think, just a reflection of the probity that he brought to his okay. politics. The Playfords were from Baptist family back in Yorkshire. Teetotalers, no smoking, probably not much enjoyment of life in some respects. Very correct, very formal, certainly no private advantage to be taken at any time. And as we'll, I'm sure, discuss, the, the Tom Playford we're talking about was what we would probably, or maybe we don't use the term anymore, but what would once have been called a wowser in Australia, oh, okay. certainly opposed to to extension of drinking hours in South Australia, vehemently opposed to gambling, liberalisation of gambling laws and so on. And I think his grandfather, Honest Tom, simply had those same attributes in terms of probity in public life. But the Tom we're talking about was born in the late 1890s. So similar to Menzies? Similar yeah. to Menzies. Menzies was 96, 1894. 94, yeah. was it? Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. Tom Playford was in the middle of the 1890s, so a very similar age. And his father was a farmer on Norton Summit growing cherries, and that's how he started off. He went off to war to Gallipoli, not at the first arrival landing at Gallipoli, but there during those battles and then served in France, came back to Australia and began resuming the farming, and not till the early 1930s, when South Australia was in the middle of a very deep depression, was he persuaded by a former war colleague who was by then in Parliament to put himself forward for what was the the new Liberal Country League that followed the amalgamation of a rural country party in South Australia with the, the Liberal Federation that had been the principal Liberal Party through the 1920s. And did he have a particular background in education? I mean, had he been to university or had he studied economics, philosophy or anything like that? Did he come with a firm set of ideas, do you think, outside of his religious background? I think he came with a very firm set of ideas, but he had absolutely no education. He left school when I think he was 14 to help on the family farm. He could read and write. He had views. But he was very antagonistic, I think, to academics and intellectuals and Mm. a good working knowledge of how the world went round but certainly not formal education. So quite different from Menzies, for example, and a lot of the federal, the people in federal politics who you see coming through who were, even if they were Australian born, they had often Mm. been educated overseas and um, a lot of of legal, people with legal backgrounds Mm. on that non-labour side of politics. Very much representative of, it's hard to say whether it was rural South Australia or metropolitan South Australia for non-South Australian listeners, Norton Summit is at the, in the Adelaide Hills at the, uh, on the eastern side of Adelaide. It's still rural farming land today. There are lots of fruit trees and cherries that hasn't been taken over by all the grapevines. 
So it's not really rural South Australia in the sense that it's remote, but it was certainly a farming background rather than an urban background that mm. he came from. And he brought those values through. And again, as we I'm sure we'll discuss, the divide inside the South Australian Liberal Party, what's become the Liberal Party, has really reflected the tension between those from a rural background and those from a metropolitan background for many, many years. So when this country party joined with the Rural Federation to join to create this Liberal and Country League, there were various concessions weren't they given to the rural electorates, which enabled them to have a greater influence and power. And as you say, that's still kind of felt within the Liberal Party as it exists yes. today. It exists within the debates within the Liberal Party in terms of where power lies, I think. The immediate consequences of that amalgamation of rural interest and the Liberal Federation was very, very obvious in the South Australian Parliament. So an agreement was reached to sort of appease the rural interests that the rural seats in South Australia would be overrepresented relative to the urban seats. In rough terms, it was something like two thirds of the population lived in Adelaide and one third lived in rural South Australia. But in terms of representation in the parliament, about two thirds of the seats in the House of Assembly were from rural South Australia and one third from the metropolitan area. So many, many, many more voters in the urban areas to elect a member of parliament than it did a member of parliament from the rural areas. And that was, in a sense, done, as I say, to appease the interests of the conservative forces that were coming into that combined LCL. But it was also defended, I don't think very satisfactorily, but it was defended by those supporting it on the basis that at that point, almost the whole of the economy of South Australia depended upon a prosperous rural region. It was very much a primary production economy and that the urban areas of South Australia were largely dependent upon how well the farming lands were doing. So the argument that someone like Tom Playford advanced was that, that the state was built, its prosperity depended upon rural South Australia and a, a well-to-do farming community. And therefore, it was important that those voices were not drowned out in the parliament, which they, they would have been. They hardly been drowned out. They would have, <laughs> well, been, if, they would have been if it was uh, one sure. vote, one value. Now in South Australia, we have a tolerance so that no seat can be more than 10% away from the average of the number yeah. of seats, as, as is the case through most of the country. As I say, it was than two to one in some respects in South Australia. There were seats where 4,000 voters would elect a member of parliament in the rural areas and 12, 13, 14,000 votes were needed to elect a member of parliament. Sort of sounds like an episode of Black Adder. Yes, it's a bit like that. (laughs) Dunny on the wall, the the famous rotten borough that they were called. Was it controversial? Well, it was controversial in the sense that the Labor Party were deeply opposed to it because... (laughs) Except for a couple of pockets of rural South Australia, it's a conservative voting area. So mm. most of the rural areas are conservative yeah. voting. There were pockets of like voters in places like Mount Gambier and, and around the Iron Triangle, Wyala, Port sure. Perry, Port Augusta yeah. and so on. But if you take those out of it, and in fact where the Labor votes were concentrated in those rural areas, paradoxically the enrolment was even larger there than the non-Labor parts of rural South Australia as well. So they really went to it with some vigour in terms of generating this malapportionment to the point where it became famously known as the playman. When you draw electoral boundaries to suit particular parties after an American government, it's called a gerrymander. In South Australia, it became known as the playmander. Now, in fairness, most of that was in place under the Premier that preceded Tom Playford. He didn't set that system up. but he, Was his predecessor conservative? His well, predecessor yeah. was the, the first LCL oh, Premier Butler. Yeah. So while Playford was not responsible for establishing it, he certainly did nothing to unravel it. He defended it vigorously and he benefited from it immensely. So through most of the Playford years, he became Premier in 38 and won every election until his final defeat in March of 1965. Through most of those years, from the mid-40s, Labor was out polling the Liberals in every election and yet was always three or four seats behind the Liberals in terms of representation in the parliament, never in a position where it was able to form government. Now, again, we need to qualify that slightly. Quite a few seats were uncontested at the time. So there would be LCL heartland seats where Labor didn't even bother putting up a candidate. Right. And similarly, there would be occasionally a Labor seat in the metropolitan area where the Libs didn't put up a candidate too. So when you look at the raw figures, we've got to allow for the fact that that not everyone was voting because there were uncontested returns. But I think most commentators would say, if you look at those figures and draw from them, there's an argument that says that probably from 43 onwards, Labor was out polling the Liberal Party on a consistent basis. And yet because of that malapportionment, Playford was secure in office. And there was never any question that he was going to win 
the elections were coronations rather than, <laughs> than contests because so, of that electoral rule. So he was Premier of South Australia for 26 years, mm. which is extraordinary. I, I think mean. it's a record in the Commonwealth. It yeah. certainly pits Robert Walpole, who was 1721 to whenever it was for 25 years, I think. And I can't think of any other elected leader in the Commonwealth. I was going to say in a fair and democratic electoral system, yeah, whether yeah. we call malapportionment of that no, order, fair and democratic is another <laughs> yes. matter, but he's certainly the longest serving leader of a government in Australia and is unlikely ever to lose that mantle. No, no. And I mean, the same with Robert Menzies at the federal level, unlikely yes. that anyone will ever be Prime Minister for 17, 17 years, years again. Yeah. It's just extraordinary. Playford was hardly present at all in these debates. The LCL affiliated with the Liberal party that Menzies was able to form. There was no other Liberal force in South Australia at the time, but it kept its own name as the South Australian Division. Unofficially, it didn't take that formal title until into the 1960s or 70s. 70, 1970s. Yeah. Oh, 76, sorry. It was 76. renamed. Yeah. And Which seems so recent. It does. It. But yeah. in a sense, it's reflecting the fact that Playford was first, second, third, Fourth priority was South Australia. He would go to Canberra, he would negotiate, he would deal with federal governments when he had to, if he could secure a benefit for South Australia. But in terms of being involving himself in the broader party structures, the idea of him becoming a federal president or something like that, I think is inconceivable. It just wasn't his focus. His principal attention was always for the benefit of South Australia. If that meant going to Canberra, if it meant negotiating with both Labor governments and Liberal governments in Canberra, then he was happy to do that. But I don't think he really bothered himself all that much with the nuances of debates taking place elsewhere in the country. Insofar as they didn't affect the yes. status of South Australia. So it says here in the notes, he was the only Premier to attend the Non-Labor Unity Conference in Canberra in October, which was the series of conferences that formed the Liberal Party in 1944. And then after some debate, the conference unanimously adopted the resolution providing that the name of the United Organisation shall be the Liberal Party of Australia in the federal sphere and in all states except South Australia, as we were saying, mm. which would retain whatever name it wanted to, which, of course, was the Liberal Country League up until the 70s. So quite a sort of a sense of South Australian exceptionalism there. And again, we've got to remember that in much of the eastern states, there was a dominant country party that was choosing not to go in to yes. affiliation with the Liberal Party. Yeah. And in a sense, that marriage had taken place in South Australia earlier. And look, I'm speculating here, but you can only assume that Playford didn't want to upset that accommodation that had been made with rural interests. And by changing the name from LCL back to a Liberal Party of a South Australian division of the Liberal Party, those dominant forces inside the organisation in South Australia and in the parliamentary party that still represented country interests would be alienated by. And again, one of the consequences of having malapportionment, where you've got most of the urban seats being won by Labor and more rural seats being won by the Liberal Party in South Australia, is that your cabinet is largely dominated by rural interests. Yes. There weren't that many metropolitan members who were available to serve in that cabinet. And what we haven't mentioned yet, top of the malapportionment that was taking place in the, the lower house, the House of Assembly, the South Australian upper house had a restricted franchise at this time. So only property owners could vote for election to the Legislative Council and voting was not compulsory. So compulsory voting was introduced in South Australia in the 1940s. That was not the case for the Legislative Council. Now, that reform of the franchise for the upper house didn't take place till the early 1970s in South Australia. So again, rural conservative interests sitting in the Legislative Council were able to have a huge influence over the internal dynamic, if you like, of oh, the LCL. Of course, of course. So that is a really interesting point, though, because in other states you had the country party still operating and that presented a challenge to the Liberal Party, even if they were often running in coalition. That presented a challenge to their electoral fortunes and they had to make accommodations, whereas here in South Australia we didn't have a national party as is today or a country party. But how much of that country party influence do you think was exerted on the LCL? Was it all about the country party in the end and there wasn't much Liberal left? Well, and that's a really interesting question, I think, because the temptation is to look at the membership of the parliamentary party and say, yes, that the rural interest dominated and you've got a cherry farmer who's the Premier without challenge or question. But what happens when you look at the sorts of policy initiatives that Playford began to pursue when he became Premier, not when he comes into the parliament, 
But when he became Premier, they were frequently things that the, probably the Labor Party would have been happy to endorse <laughs> yeah. themselves. Yeah. And so paradoxically, rural interests were strong inside the Liberal Party, but they were unable to stop Playford doing a whole lot of things that they opposed. Ah, and okay. so when it That's came to the most contentious of all of these, when Playford nationalised electricity, in the aftermath of the Second World War, and he did that in short and simple terms. He did it because he wanted to be able to provide a secure and dependable supply of cheap electricity to encourage industry to South Australia. The Liberal Country League members in the Upper House vigorously opposed that, and it only went through with Labor support, and in fact, that one late conversion. And the Labor Premier was sitting there saying, go for it, Tom. <laughs> we wouldn't have had the courage to get this legislation through, but it's nice to see you doing it on our behalf, as yeah. it were. And in fact, a number of commentators have said, even if Labor was in office at the time, they wouldn't have even tried nationalising electricity because they knew it would have come a cropper in the Upper House. Yeah. So Playford dealt with this very conservative rump within the party, and he was able to, in a sense, straddle that division inside the parliamentary party to bring what now we would think of as the more moderate progressive interests to bear, yes. even though he didn't have the numbers inside the parliamentary party. It's amazing. I mean, re referring to what you're talking about, the Labor opposition leader saying we couldn't get away with nationalising what became known as ETSA, mm. the electricity business, it was Mick O'Halloran, wasn't it? And there's a great quote I have here that he pronounced of Playford's policy that it was more socialistic than Labor could ever hope to implement, even if it were an office. And he described Playford as the best Labor Premier South Australia ever had. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was amazing. the leader of the Labor opposition. <laughs> So Playford, <laughs> in many senses, well, Playford had an easier relationship. <laughs> well, and the story goes that the leaders of the LCL in the Upper yeah. House actually sat on the left of the Speaker. Wow. You know, so really? they regarded themselves as the opposition, opposition to the party that was in office in the lower house. But Playford's authority, and this is the magic somehow, he was able to manage those tensions within that party to the point where there was never a plausible challenger to him. And he did it in a way that you couldn't get away with now. He would go off and negotiate directly mm. with an industry owner or a factory owner, whatever it might be, a CEO of an industry in North America or in the UK or in the eastern states and cut a deal with them there mm. and then and then come back to Adelaide and ring up the public service and say, right, we need a new factory up here and we need a train line going to it. Literally within eight yeah. weeks. Wow. And then he'd tell a cabinet after that. I mean, it wasn't a sort of a, a great consensual cabinet. No. I, I think when cabinet sat, he was very happy to allow people to express their views and he'd try and reach a consensus. But this was a man who was making decisions that he believed in the interests of South Australia and then basically staring down anybody who suggested an alternative. What I find amazing, though, is, I mean, Playford sounds like he had a sort of almost dictatorial authority over... South Australian politics, and yet he seems to have had unimpeachable values in a way. I mean, there's no sort of suggestion that he was acting in his own self-interest or benefit of himself no. or his cronies. There wasn't that. He was, as you say, fixated on the betterment of South Australia. Absolutely. But then to, to the point where there's a famous quote from Menzies, which I don't have in front of me, but Menzies is railing against Playford as this <laughs> monstrous tyrant who keeps coming in and twisting his arm and winning things for South Australia that yeah. over and above that they should. Yeah. And then Menzies qualifies it by saying, but in a sense I forgive him because there was never a hint that he was doing it for his own advancement. It was for the good of South Australia. And Menzies, in a sense, was uh, still peeved but recognising there was a level of integrity in the approach that Playford was bringing. So, I mean, again, the story is a legion, but a South Australian delegation in London had a night off and they decided they'd go and visit the House of Commons and Playford made them pay for their own taxi yeah. because it was not part of the official yeah. movement. When he left office, I think Dunstan arranged, Don Dunstan arranged when he left office as a farewell present, allegedly there was a pen in Playford's office, a wooden pen that he really enjoyed using, but it was state government property. So mm. it was left there when he ceased being Premier and they made special provision to remove it from state property and give it to him. as a. And he was offered a car and a chauffeur when Dunstan became Premier of South Australia in recognition of the contribution that Playford made. He bought his own second-hand car after he'd left office and drove himself in that for the rest of his life on a wow. very modest pension. There was yeah. never a hint of Playford being in it for what he could get out of it. Which, you know, is testament to him 
because there would have been temptations to, to act in other yeah. ways. And we saw by the mid-60s, when Playford is leaving office, without wanting to defame premiers of other states, we saw very powerful premiers there who, about whom I think some questions can be asked about. Yeah. Whether the same level of probity was maintained is perhaps to be questioned. So can we talk a bit more about Playford's political views? What was his ideology? Again, very different from Menzies. You know, Menzies, well, he certainly talked in big terms about the importance of free enterprise. And back, of course, in the 50s and 60s, there was a level of protection in the economy that we don't have today. That was partly about Australia being a very young country and trying to protect the nascent industries here, especially post-World War II trying to rebuild the country and rapidly industrialise. But Playford didn't sort of really have any truck with private enterprise particularly. He, he was, was quite happy with private enterprise as long as it was locating itself in South Australia oh, right. okay, and employing true. South Australians. <laughs> and he would do what he could to facilitate that. Right. So, yeah. And this is the interesting thing. He was first elected in 1933 and in his maiden speech to the parliament, he was attacking the bureaucracy and he was attacking some of the government policy. We're at the height of the depression and there were government policies intended to alleviate some of the worst successes of the Depression. And Playford made the comment that, look, if people go broke, they go broke. There's nothing government should do about it. Right. This is a hardline laissez-faire, yeah. get government yeah. out of people's lives, yeah. minimum taxes, sure. minimum regulation, very predictable sort of very small government position that you'd expect a conservative cherry farmer yes. to be bringing to bear. Yes. By the time he became Premier, he argued again against the establishment of the South Australian Housing Trust which was, became one of the dominant agencies that facilitated post-war development in South Australia. He said, what's government getting involved in building houses for? That's for private enterprise. By the time he became Premier, he's seeing very clearly that there is a vulnerability in the South Australian economy if it's simply based on rural production and that it's critical that we build industrial capacity in South Australia. So he becomes Premier in 38. Already it's clear that war is a more than possible outcome. And he's already thinking through how South Australia are going to be involved in this and how can the South Australian economy, in a sense, benefit from the inevitable changes that are going to be coming. So from very early on, he goes to Canberra and lobbies for the establishment of munitions factories in Adelaide on the basis that they're less vulnerable to attack from enemy shipping than if yeah. they were on the west, east coast or the west coast. Which seems a fair point. Seems a good argument yeah, and yeah. it won. So the munitions factories were being built in South Australia. He would talk to British companies that were looking to build industrial infrastructure in Australia at the time and convinced them that the South Australian market again would be safer during the war and that there would be a cheap workforce available. He spent a lot of his time in politics facilitating the development of private industry. He nationalised electricity very famously, took private production of electricity into state control. But he did that on the basis, firstly, of a Royal Commission that recommended it, a Royal Commission that was established by the Legislative Council, who ended up vehemently opposing the findings of that commission. But he knew that if they could provide electricity, if they could control electricity, firstly, they could instruct the generators to be using brown coal from Lee Creek in South Australia, not be dependent upon shipping black coal from New South Wales, subject to shipping problems, enemy attack, potentially trade union activities. There were threats of strikes in those New South Wales coal fields. So it would become a more secure supply, he argued, but the company wasn't prepared to listen to that argument, but he could do that as a nationalised industry. And he also said, if we've got cheap electricity, we can go to industries that are electricity dependent and say, you'll get cheaper energy here. And what's more, if I use this housing trust that once upon a time I'd opposed, but we build huge new urban developments, certainly in the post-war years, we've got post-war migration arriving, I will produce you a labour force, which because they're living in subsidised housing, arguably will be happier with slightly lower wages than you would find in the eastern states. So come to South Australia, it's got a history of very, very limited industrial conflict, very few strikes relative to the eastern states. Was the union movement less of a feature in South Australia than it was, say, in Victoria and New South Wales? It was alive and well, but it wasn't as militant. No. And again, that's probably a whole different podcast. But the demographics of South Australia, without that big Irish Catholic working class movement into Australia that we see in New South Wales and Victoria in particular, you get a more homogenous community in South Australia. And it was a less militant trade union movement. So 
Hayford could honestly point to statistics which showed that there was much less industrial conflict, fewer days lost to mm. strike activity in South Australia than Melbourne and Sydney in particular. And the workers have got cheap housing and the electricity is cheap and I'll do you a tax deal as well. So significant companies were coming and building on the munitions factories in the post-war years, they could be repurposed for other purposes. Some weapons research from the Department of Defence and light industry that grows. South Australia had brought in really before the war, it had been able to attract General Motors, which becomes General Motors Holden. And they had Chrysler also in South Australia, which ultimately became Mitsubishi. And, and both of those remained dominant players in manufacturing until the early years of the 20th century, when Australian car making disappeared. So Playford was quite deliberate in utilising the powers of the state in a pretty arbitrary way. And there's a very famous story of when actual cotton spinning, not milling the cotton, but spinning the cotton, they were looking for a place in Australia to set up. Again, late 1930s, threat of war, we need to diversify our production, go to Australia, and they were going to set up in the East States. And the story goes that Playford basically said, if I can build you the plant in eight weeks, will you put the machines here? Because they were in storage in South Australia. They said yes, not believing for a minute that this enormous and the factory was built with a couple of days to spare. Amazing. Just commandeering labour, yeah. uh, you know, 24 hour shifts, working in conjunction with unions to do that. And so nothing like an environmental impact report or a business case study or cabinet approval or anything like that. It's Playford ringing up the, the Commissioner of Works and saying, right, Get a lot of brickies on that site tomorrow. Clem, it reminds me a few years ago, Qantas was casting around for a new headquarters in Australia. I think it was Qantas, not Virgin, but maybe it was Virgin. And I remember there was some speculation, oh, would South Australia pitch for it? You know, there's mm. a cheaper, you know, I guess rents are cheaper here and the wages tend to be a bit lower here than the eastern states. And it didn't, basically. It just went, oh, well, no, probably not sort of worth us even being in the game. There was a sort of a sense, oh, well, we probably wouldn't win it, so let's mm. not try anyway. Whereas you think a Playford, he would have promised them the absolute world, no taxes, you know. Well, <laughs> not necessarily no taxes, but, but, but certainly concessionary. A, a there would have been um, inducements. Yes, inducements yes. would be there. Yeah. And he had at his disposal a housing trust, which could literally build a new suburb next door to the factory and build a railway line to it and provide other infrastructure. So the state was very active in terms of building the infrastructure required to enable private enterprise to be here and to prosper. And do you think that that type of approach to economic stimulation in South Australia and the policy levers used to do that exists to this day in contrast to the way it's done in Victoria and New South Wales? I mean, I think... No, I don't. I think, and again, it's a different topic in a sense, but national competition policy has changed things in very considerable ways and arguably for the good because we saw situations in the 70s, 80s where states were literally competing with each other for the location of production centres or whatever it might be. And it's a bit of a race to the bottom. Mm. What you're doing is you're cutting taxes and provide mm. no stamp duty and providing incentives and private yeah. enterprise simply yeah. plays off who the various states until it gets a deal. competitive federalism. That was sort of part of the plan, wasn't it? That states would compete with each other to create the best possible conditions for business and yeah i'm uh, not sure that the federal the the founding fathers of federation (laughs) thought of it in quite those terms but that it can be argued that that was a consequence but when it gets to the point where you're actually providing incentives to private enterprise arguably the cost of the state in order to get another few hundred jobs coming maybe just before an election then you've got to argue is this actually a very good use of those competitive arrangements but these were not questions that bothered playford And I don't think there was any other state at the time that was as assiduous in thinking through how it can manipulate the circumstances it got. Because South Australia is a relatively small state in terms of population. It's not the natural point of destination for capital or labour and had and has few natural resources. So it's got to do something in order to make itself attractive. And Playford increased productivity. South Australia's contribution towards the share of South Australia's manufacture increased at a faster rate in those Playford years than it did anywhere in South Australia than it did anywhere else in the country. I don't think if you had a Playford now, they would last all that long. For a start, you can't make arbitrary decisions sitting in the back of a taxi in New York to arrange a tyre company to come and set up. I don't know. Wasn't the MBN done on the back of a... <laughs> I don't know. Was it a, a cocktail napkin? Possibly, <laughs> but, but, but you've still got to go through a cabinet process. Yeah, you've still got sure. to, you know, for half of the things that Playford did, you'd have an environmental report that would take a yes. year and a half and 
The wheels turn a bit slower now, I they think. Do. But he certainly had the capacity to make the most of the remarkable circumstances he found himself in. And he did all of this confident that, in a sense, he didn't have to worry too much. As long as he didn't alienate his parliamentary party too much, he was unlikely ever to lose office through much of his period. Now, paradoxically, by the time we get towards the end of the Playford period, his own success is the one of the principal causes of his ultimate failure because the growth of metropolitan Adelaide as the new suburbs of Elizabeth and Salisbury developed and so on, and that industrial growth takes place in the north and the south, the southern suburbs of Adelaide, then you're starting to get population spilling out beyond what was regarded as the urban seats. So you're getting Labor voters drifting into the peri-urban seats that were malapportioned with very few electors. And and bit by bit, chip by chip, the Labor Party is beginning to win those seats. And I think it's the 65, what is the 65 election when Playford falls? Labor win Glenelgan, they win the Barossa. And so partly Playford is beginning to lose his control because the malapportionment is no longer working as it had. And the historic higher vote for Labor is now beginning to tell in terms of seats being won in the House. And he's also, in a sense, beginning to lose the feel. So the popular account for why the seat of Barossa was lost, because lots of people up there wanted a more liberal regime in relation to gambling and betting. Oh, right. Okay. And Playford was vehemently opposed to this. I think the retiring member from the Barossa said, well, you'll lose the seat if you don't make the changes. And he lost the seat and that was the end. So the last few years, the margin was very tight. The 62 election, they were dependent upon a couple of independents mm. to stay there. So while he was winning consistently, yes. the margin for error was in terms of electoral politics was getting smaller and smaller. And by 65, this chap who'd been running the place since late 1930s began to seem a bit out of touch with yeah. the development you know, we're on the cusp of what became the Dunstan decade with the liberalisation of social rules. So Playford was a radical socialist in the eyes of his critic in relation to industrial policy, but he was a throwback to an earlier age mm. when it came to social policy. Well, he loses when he's about 70 years old, doesn't he? Yes, something yeah. like that. So yeah. he's, Early I mean, for that era, yeah. he's quite an old uh, man. You know, and sort of things like he remained deeply hostile to universities and yet people were beginning to go to universities in larger numbers. When it was proposed that foreign languages were being taught in South Australian schools, he said, why do we bother English? is good enough. He's out of touch with yeah. what's becoming the more contemporary, modern, post-war, baby boomer Australia. While he still has his heroes in the Liberal Party when he's there at the end. We're also seeing new Liberal members. So Robin Milhouse is elected in the 50s, 53 election. Steele Hall, who ultimately replaces Playford as leader of the Liberal Party, the LCL, is in the Parliament by then. And these are Liberals who are winning Liberal seats in the metropolitan area. Right. In what are still, what were until perhaps the last election, <laughs> safe Liberal seats yes. in the foothills and the eastern suburbs. Yeah. And they're bringing a different set of values. They're really challenging that old dominant clique of rural members who've not moved with the times. And there we're beginning to see the emergence of the split between the liberal moderates and conservatives that arguably is still within the party in South Australia today. Steele Hall, of course, becomes Premier for a couple of years. He pushes through the electoral reform that Playford resisted. Getting rid of playmandering. Getting rid of the playmandering, <laughs> bringing in the one vote, one value. And I think knowing that it would cost him office, but doing it yeah. because he thought it was an indefensible position. He'd argued for electoral reform, has had Robin Milhouse within the party. I think Steele Hall deserves all high praise, probably one of the only one I can think, political leader who deliberately set out policy that he suspected would cost him government because he thought it was the right thing to yeah. do in terms of democracy. Yeah. And then, of course, he ultimately leaves the Liberal Party for a while as part of the Liberal movement. Yes. And that's that divide between the moderates, progressives, if you like, versus the conservatives, the wets versus the dries that we still see. So in a sense, Playford, by failing to move with the times, so, you know, it's almost impossible to imagine Tom Playford moving with the times, but yeah. by failing to, to find a successor maybe a bit yeah. earlier, he's left the party sort of atrophied. And then it moves in an unpredictable way and there's a real tension within it. Was there a push to get him to anoint a successor? Because, I mean, you know, Menzies calls time in 66 after Mm. 17 years as leader and and obviously he'd had the previous time as leader under the UAP. So he starts, it looks to Harold Holt, 
this is the next generation. He recognises that Harold Holt has some different views from yep. him on, particularly on some sort of social, cultural issues. And he doesn't sort of seem to have a problem with that. I mean, when he announces no. his retirement, his time is... Yes, he draws a line time. under it and exactly, leaves. Exactly, and leaves. But he, Playford didn't do that, clearly. And Menzies did that at a time of his own choosing, in the yes. sense that he just said, I've been here long enough. Yeah. Playford, of course, lost the election in 65. Yeah. But still, um, he would have had a sense. He Someone would have had a sense, but he stayed on as leader. He stayed on as leader for a year and a half wow. before Steel Hall emerged. Now, again, the one thing that people from outside South Australia perhaps don't appreciate in the South Australian Liberal Party at that time, the two House parties met separately. So the lower House members met separately to elect the leader and the upper House members met separately to elect their leadership also. So it was the... House of Assembly members, less dominated by that conservative rump in the upper house, who were electing the new leader of the LCL as it still was, and that was still Hall. He had a huge battle to get the electoral reform through the upper house. That's, again, a completely different story. But so Playford, in a sense, is losing touch, I think, with the mindset of a changing Australia at that time. And the other way that he's not so much the author of his own failure in this regard, but while it's possible to point to the Playford period in office as a remarkable time of growth for South Australia, and South Australia's contribution to the national economy grows very considerably, and its population grows, I think, a bit faster than some of the other states. Certainly, its productivity outstrips the other states at that time. It's, in a sense, a, a fragile platform upon which this is built. And it's dependent upon tariffs. Yeah. So the production of white goods, the production of cars, small scale industrial production, small factories and so on, were able to survive in the 40s and the 50s and into the 1960s. But by then it's clear that that time and that period of the Australian economy is beginning to change. And certainly when tariffs go or are cut back considerably early 70s, then the South Australian economy is left vulnerable and mm. fragile. Even with the nationalised electricity industry in South Australia. Not nationalised because it wasn't native, but the state-run the state state electricity. Owned. I mean, they could have yes, set be, the price, because, made it because, really cheap. Yeah, because the, the production of washing machines and Hills Hoist clothes lines and cars and so on is no longer just dependent upon cheap en- energy. Other imports we're, we're seeing well. imports from yeah. areas with much, mm. much cheaper labour. So the ownership of electricity is another huge political battle yes. in South Australia from the time when the Olsen Brown, Dean Brown and John Olsen government was in, in office in the late 1990s. But that wasn't enough through the 60s really to protect that. So while the economy was much more industrialised at the end of the Playford regime than it was at the start when it was principally in a rural primary production based economy, it still arguably wasn't as diversified in terms of tertiary sector and so on to be able to withstand the changes that came in Australia in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And so the South Australian economy, again, has become a much less significant contributor to the national picture. Whether that's whether you blame Playford for having it such a narrow base yeah. or whether you praise him for transforming it in the way that he did, I suppose, is pays your money and takes your pick. But South Australian governments and South Australian federal MPs have over, I mean, I think of my lifetime, they have have often played to the federal government, bring industries here, defence industries. Yep. And that was something that it was even evident during the Playford era, particularly during World War II. You were saying this is a state away from the eastern states, away from exposed ocean. It advance. wasn't so much the federal politicians, though. So, again, if you look, at the, Menzies, if you look at the Menzies cabinet, yep. the cabinets, there was one or two South Australians and they weren't holding the key seats. Yeah. They weren't the principal ones. That, in a sense, comes much later. Mm. So South Australia, in a sense, was a state that voted Labor more than Liberal. Yeah, at a federal level. At a federal yeah. level and, and at a state level. It just didn't win the seats no, exactly. at, at, at the lower level. It was Playford's direct relationship. And again, we started off talking about the parallels with Menzies. Menzies and Playford didn't get on. They no. had a respect and regard for each other, but they didn't warm to each other. Playford was much closer the stories go to Chifley, mm. who we could talk to and Chifley would welcome him and they'd chew the fat. They'd go in there, they'd talk before premiers meetings and sort of line up some of the outcomes, I think, and just manage <laughs> it that way because they had a very positive relationship. So interesting. I mean, Menzies comes from a humble background, but a very education-wise, yep. very different. Yes. Very, very different. I mean, he's highly educated. He's a scholarship boy through schools and university, yep. highly accomplished lawyer. Experience in the yep. Victorian state government yes. before going into federal politics. Yeah. A deep thinker, yeah. very philosophical. Yeah. 
he and Playford would have had a very different way of approaching issues. I mean, yes. Playford's obviously an incredibly clever politician. I think Playford arguably was a more... The word I wanted to use then was ruthless. I'm not sure mm. that's the right word, but he was mm. certainly much more pragmatic and single-minded mm. about looking after his little patch. Yeah. Menzies, of course, had a very different set of responsibilities sure. as a federal leader. And also as someone who saw himself on the international yes. stage and, as well. Yeah, and saw himself as, a, yeah. as, a, as an international statesman, you're right. Yeah. So that's not to say Menzies obviously didn't care about Australian economic development. He clearly did, but he went about securing change in in different ways. So the idea that someone like Playford would follow Menzies in the support for the money pumped into tertiary education in the late 1950s, which Menzies saw as a springboard for an educated society and and change, that complete anathema Mm. to Playford. Well, clearly didn't want people to go to university to learn foreign languages, God forbid. You're right. They both came from relatively humble backgrounds. Playford's grandfather, of course, was a strong figure. We haven't even touched yet on the relationship between the Playfords and the Downers, but mm. that's several generation yes. iteration there. Yeah. So also, John Downer also and, difficult, I understand. Yes. <laughs> so John Downer and honest Tom Playford yes. in the turn of the, the, the 20th century did not like each other at all. No. And then famously, when Tom Playford was Premier here and looking at, at a road going through the Adelaide Hills, it managed to find its way through Sir Alec Downer's <laughs> property and Playford knew what was happening and was not at all averse to the outcome. So Playford's it's still relationship by the way. I'm sure it is. <laughs> 50 years, 60 years. Every old. time you drive down the road. <laughs> so Playford was not the sort of person who was naturally at home and comfortable and collaborative with his party colleagues in other jurisdictions. Mm. He would work with whoever he thought was going to give South Australia the best yeah, deal. So that no sense of partisan loyalty at all. It was all about South Australia. The loyalty was to South, to Australia. South Australia. And if that meant getting on better with Chifley mm. and finding Menzies' relationship a bit harder, mm. then so be it. Do you think he was sort of an early Nick Xenophon then maybe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, crikey. No. But a Wales version. No, 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 because he didn't have that. Uh, showmanship. Yeah, the showmanship. Thank you. That's, I was looking for the right word. The idea of Playford performing tricks down in front of the parliament to, yeah. to get media attention. The sheep. Uh, yeah. So very different. But the parallel is just a single-minded yeah. concern about the well-being of the people I'm representing. Mm. For Nick, that was in the state upper house and for a while in the Senate. For Playford, it was simply that I'm in charge of South Australia. I can see there's a whole lot of problems. You know, this company's not managing that properly. We're not getting labour. We're dependent. If there's a drought and sheep and wool prices fall, the whole state goes into depression. We've got to diversify economic resources. What do I need to do it? I don't care. So that pragmatism in terms of who I'll work with and how I'll do it is paramount. Whereas you get the sense, if we go back to Menzies, that it was more about identifying a series of processes to get to the goals rather than the yeah. goals themselves. Yeah. And I guess finally to the Liberal Party's fortunes, the creation of Menzies and others in the 40s and you know, through Playford obviously has a degree of success up until 65 at a state level, the fortunes after Playford are pretty, pretty poor. They're dire. For the, the, the South Party. Australian Liberal Party is the least successful party division, a major party division in Australia, in mm. all nine jurisdictions mm. in the last 60 years. It's been in office for about 18, just over 18, I think it is years, since March 1965. Every other party, Labor and Liberal, in all of the other jurisdictions has had more success than that. The last time that, that a Liberal government won two successive majority elections was towards the end of the Playford period. They were in minority in 62, so the election before that, 59 and 56, they are won. the last two times that they yeah. won successive majority Elections. Yeah. Now, John Olson won second term for the Liberals in 97, but it was a minority government. Yeah. And every other time, Steel Hall, Tonkin, have been, and most recently Marshall, been single term governments. And the Liberal Party, I think, has been bedeviled by those divisions that were apparent by the end. There were generational divisions within the Liberal Party between the Conservatives and the Moderates, and the squabbles internally have hampered that party. And it gets to a point where it almost becomes self-fulfilling. Because Mm. if you're an aspiring liberal politician in South Australia, where would you set your sight? If you're looking to go into state parliament, there's every chance you'll be spending most of your career in opposition. opposition, And so why would you bother doing that? Mm. So the good talent is not going in. The quality in state parliament is always subject to improvement. Let's be, I'll try and be diplomatic about it. But in the South Australian Liberal Party, the chances are you will spend a lot of your career in opposition. And do you think that is 
I mean, there'll be lots of reasons and heaps of analysis that we could do. Again, subject to another podcast, we should, of course, draw this to a conclusion. But do you think if there had been a country party and a Liberal Party that maybe just operated in coalition, say, as we see at a federal level, where you say, well, they're your seats, the country party seats, you fight them on your set of values Mm. and interests, where sort of more the metropolitan small L Liberals will fight for those seats with our set of values and interests, and then... When it comes to forming government, we can work together and, and make concessions to basically make the relationship work. Perhaps mm. that led it's to an interesting, greater political yeah, fortunes it's an interesting for the question. non-Labor side the, of the I mean, the LCL came together originally think, yeah, in the early 30s yeah. to avoid three-corner contests. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was at a time when you had first passed the post. Too. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it was a successful process then. Sure. And look, there may well be something in what you're suggesting. We'll never know. It's one no, of those great hypotheticals. <laughs> but I do note that on the rare occasions when nationals have been elected, um, sorry, country members, members now National Party elected into the South Australian Parliament. So the Country Party, National Party of Australia does exist in South Australia. It's just very, very low levels of support. The most recent National MP who was elected, Colleen Maywald from the Riverland, sat in opposition to Labor initially, but ultimately went and joined the RAN administration. And she did so on the basis that Labor was the government and my voice will be heard in the cabinet much more effectively than it will on the opposition benches. And she was there and she became the Minister for Water and argued for South Australia's yeah. water interests. So it's not to say that the Nationals would, Labor is a dominant party, that the Nationals would always be wanting to sit in that coalition if the chance of getting their voice into a Labor government was there. And we've seen a number of cases in more recent years where notionally conservative, either ex-liberals or conservative independents elected to seats that would normally be liberal seats yes. sitting inside Labor cabinets. And yes. that, again, is just testimony to the professionalism of Labor and to the lack of cohesion and organisational strength of the Liberal Party, I think. So, again, at risk of taking too long over this. A former Liberal Premier who resigned a seat a year ahead of election generating a by-election led to that seat being won by an independent mm. who is still in the parliament. That's going back you know, three elections, I think it is now, yeah. still in the parliament and still a, a minister in the Labor government. Yeah. Had that individual been persuaded to stay in the parliament and have the election of a general election rather than the by-election, I don't think the seat would have been lost. And that's just an example of the Liberals not managing that process Mm. well enough. And again, how much of the problems of the Stephen Marshall government have because of internal management of the factions? Probably Mm. something we need to think about more and and say for another podcast. But it's certainly a factor, I think, in the disaffection. You know, the Marshall government lost, I think, five members towards the end of its term. Some of those for different reasons. But again, it talks of a party that's lacking a unity of purpose and a discipline Mm. to actually overcome problems and to win office. And which was something that when Menzies was creating the Liberal Party in 44 with others, he identified as a problem of its predecessor, UAP, that you needed a unity of purpose. You needed an organisation that could support the party on the ground and bringing together disparate voices but under one banner without being beholden to vested interests too was another really big big Mm. priority for him. Yes. It was so important but that, you know, unity of purpose and a set of values around which you coalesce. Yes, you might disagree on the sort of edges but... That unity is. Yeah. Well, anyway. This unity uh, is death yes, in politics. Yes, indeed, Clem. Well, lovely to have you, Clem McIntyre, on the Afternoon Light podcast on this beautiful sunny afternoon in springtime Adelaide Hills. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure too. Thank you very much. The Afternoon Light podcast is brought to you by the Robert Menzies Institute at the University of Melbourne. You can find more about the Institute and our podcast at robertmenziesinstitute.org.au. We're also on Twitter, on Facebook and LinkedIn. We look forward to you joining our show next week. Thank you.